Welcome to Sales Velocity TV, where we pull back the curtain on how the top businesses in the world sell more with less resistance. Bringing over 50 plus years of combined sales experience and over 100 million in revenue generated, please welcome the hosts of Sales Velocity TV and two incredibly entertaining gentlemen, Andrew Cass and Aaron Parkinson. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Sales Velocity TV. I'm Andrew, that's Aaron, and we're going to talk today about kind of a counterintuitive topic, why your customers may just want you to sell them more stuff. Did I say that right? I, is, is, I, it, it, it's, well, could I want it you be? To remove, the word, remove the word may, and then you've got it. I was, yeah. I injected that one by design, by the way. <laughs> I, but, I know you uh, did. But it, it, throw it out. It doesn't belong here. Why they want you to sell them more stuff. I think, you know, to preface this, Aaron, most, I guess, under offer services, products, and upgraded ideas to their clients, and they end up going somewhere else to get them. We talked a little bit about this on the last episode. We'll continue on this one, but I want to have you set the stage here today because you have a great case study that you said you wanted to bring to the table here today from a private client, I believe. Correct. Yeah. We have actually got two that we're going to talk about today, but first off, happy Friday to you, sir. Happy Friday to everybody else around the planet. Welcome to Sales Velocity. If this is your first show, uh, you're going to be able to take stuff from today and implement it immediately into your business. And if you're a long time watcher or listener, we just want to say thank you. I think we hit another uh, milestone this week. Another weekend. milestone we this week. One of the most popular shows in the business and marketing and sales and entrepreneurial space. Thousands and thousands of downloads from dozens and dozens of countries. So we appreciate you listening and watching live. We're live here today, always on the Facebook page, the Public Sales Velocity TV Facebook page. All past episodes are at salesvelocitytv.com. But I know a lot listen on the go in your favorite podcast platform. So yes, you're right. We appreciate it. Keep watching because we keep bringing the goods to the table. Absolutely. So let's set the table. So you and I have a lot of private clients um, that we work with. And we this week I had two. And they were, they were both in different industries. But they both happened to be in the same model. So these were information marketers, but I'm going to tie this back to e-commerce. I'm going to tie this back to retail. I don't care what you're in. This is going to make sense to you. There is a certain psychology with a lot of business owners where they feel like they're being oppressive or possibly even underhanded when they sell the customer more stuff. What do you mean by underhanded? Well, there's this this almost like I've been talking to a lot of clients lately about this who who quite honestly have not been listening to my advice. Yeah, and you know what happens when people don't listen to my advice? Uh, I get they, listen, it doesn't end well from what I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> so right? I don't like where this is going, but I think it's going somewhere. Right. So I'm explaining to them the math of your business. I'm explaining them the cost of customer acquisition. I'm explaining to them the cost of media. I'm explaining to them the cost of scaling their business, scaling their business from a seven figure business to a multiple seven, to an eight figure, to a nine figure, right? And I'm explaining to them one of the core elements, which is that there always must be another or a next, right? You cannot be a one and done product and continue to scale and build a business, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'll give you an example of a one and done product where you make a whole bunch of money in the year. Remember the sham wow? Yes. Remember Info that? Uh, TV, TV, uh, infomercial right. Type product, right? Sham wow came out, great infomercial, sold a ton. Now it's gone, right? They forgot to That's put it, what we call in my world, your world as well. They forgot to put a tail on the business model. Correct. By tail, right. we mean, money. right. By tail, we mean that when you've proved concept and you've proven you can sell a lot of that thing, you better have a what's next or you're going to have a thing fizzle out. Correct. Right? Correct. And and the, the more that you try to make it grow, the more channels of media that you're on, the more expensive it becomes. Yeah. And the thinner your margins get. And then if you have one bad month, let's just say costs go up in media, you know, Prime example, we're coming into fourth quarter. 
We'll use a channel that we talk about all the time, Facebook and Instagram, notoriously jack their uh, advertising costs up going into fourth quarter because they know everybody's piling in, right? And then come January, they bring them back down to normal, but they never bring them back down to where they were the year before. Mm -hmm. So it's always this incremental increase, right? So it doesn't matter what channel you're on. The more you scale, the more costly it becomes, which means the more value and deeper your product line must become mm -hmm. to maintain profitability. But circling back around to your question, a lot of beginner to intermediate entrepreneurs have this like negative emotional feeling around selling their customers more stuff. Like somehow they're doing something to them instead of doing something for them. Well said. Right? Very clear distinction there. So I'm going to say it again. Doing something to them versus doing something for them. And I spoke to two clients this week and both of them want to scale. Mm -hmm. And both of them, I've told them, you don't have a deep enough product line to scale because it's going to get more expensive. Risk is going to get higher. And you don't got enough. And they said, well, we, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to be pounding our customers over the head with stuff. I said, ah, stop right there. You have a psychology problem, not a business problem. And that's ultimately what we're talking about today. Andrew, how many times have you run into clients who are in this position? Uh, quite a bit because... Oftentimes, business owners get married to their initial product, their first baby, so to speak. So they want to milk that and make that everything, and they can't really see past it for a little while. You get attached to it. So it's always good to have outside consultants and coaches and, and, and outside objective views of what's going on. Because if you don't maintain that step away view of the business, you'll get caught up in just running that one product forever and ever and ever and ever. You can do it. You can go far. There's plenty of people that we see and businesses that we see where they have taken a product pretty far and pretty deep. But the really good ones will, like I said before, add the tails. They'll add the back end. They'll have not only a front end, but a back end. They might even have a middle. They might even move to events. They might move to coaching and consulting. They might add new products, manufacture new products. So they're, they're, they're more like a machine than just a single product focused business. Right, a machine continues to like look at Apple. I'll give you like I guess the most extreme example of, in the world, which don't don't take this everybody and go, oh, but I'm not Apple. I can't take it. But but take the lesson of Apple. Started off with music, iTunes. Somehow it got into phones. Then it got into tablets. It's always been about computers. They're always innovating and evolving and launching new things. And people are waiting for the next new thing. Now I know that's an extreme example. You won't have customers in lines outside your door for your next release, but. Look at the model that Steve Jobs innovated, the launch model, the what's next model, the innovative model, the new version model, the 2.0, the 3.0, the 4.0, right? The more you can do that, what you're also doing, which is unrecognizable to most, is you're keeping interest very high within your world because when the next thing launches or the next version of it launches, people are wired. We as humans are wired to what's next and what's new. And if you don't have a what's next and what's new, guess what? you are suddenly not that interesting anymore. So this becomes incredibly important to keep attention as much as it is important to be increasing customer value, which we talked about in the last episode. And long and answer to a short Apple, question. Because you used Apple, th this actually ties in really well to what I want to talk about next. So there's the psychology of like, I, I don't want to do more to them versus do more for them. Mm -hmm. That has to be overcome. And then there's the second part, which is actually thinking about stopping and thinking about and understanding your customer well enough to know what else they're going to need next or what else they need today that might be in alignment with where you're at, right? And, and a lot of people like, well, you know, I'll, I'll use an example. Like I sell life insurance. You know, people just come to me for life insurance. Cool. So people who want life insurance, 
that's it. They, there's nothing else you could possibly. There's no offer other them. financial instrument in the world that they could be interested in, right? <laughs> right. Impossible. So you're that they're not going to be interested in, you know, disability insurance or business insurance or home insurance right. or even taking a step back and be starting to think creatively. If somebody's like, you know, responsible enough to want to get insurance, mm-hmm. right? They're probably educated in the financial space, right? So maybe there's some financial services that could be offered, or maybe there's some business services that could be offered. You know, there's like, you just have to take a step back and, and really not, not just analyze, but ask your customers, like, what are the other things that matter in their life? You know, what are the other areas that they're really passionate about, blah, 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 blah. And while you've got their attention, start to build supplemental products or at worst relationships where you could introduce them to people with supplementary products and create an additional revenue stream for yourself with referral fees or, or whatever the, that the case may be, right? And circling back to your Apple example, okay, this is a company that started with computers, then it went into iPods. Music, then phones, iTunes. Right, then iTunes. So we went from computers to, to music listening devices mm-hmm. to streaming music to phones, to phones, to phones to that Apple become computers, to Apple TV, street, like they went right into the Netflix space. Yep. Right. To now you're starting to see on websites, Apple pay. How does Apple they're pay? In, they're in payments have now. Anything to do with computers. Exactly. And now right. That, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, that's now that, that's instructive well. of them noticing trends also. They're not just going, wow, we have a cool idea today. Let's get into payments. No, there's a reason they got into music. There's a reason they got into payments. There's a reason they got into phones. There's a reason that you and I think they might be getting into marketing platform like a Facebook, like a Google, right? Sure. We think they might be they going there next, right? That's what's next, right? That's what's next. And so, so you don't just throw what's next in there back. for the sake of it. You figure out what is, what is, what is the trend dictating it. Well, and it's what else do they want, right? Like somebody in their organization, somebody who's very smart said, hmm, we've sold a lot of phones and we've sold a lot of computers. What do people do with phones and computers? Well, they listen to music. Okay, let's do a music streaming service. They listen to, they watch movies. Okay, let's do a movie service Mm -hmm. um, and they buy stuff. Okay, well, we've already sold them all our stuff, right? We've already got all of our core products. What if we could- Can they pay for us? Right? (laughs) Right? What if we could- what if, because they trust us so much, what if we created a payments company and put ourselves on every website on the planet and put it inside of our system and we could make a little rip off their payments because they like us, they know us, they like us, they trust us, yep. right? Yep. That's somebody who's thinking about what else do my customers want from me, right? And that really takes me to the next point. So the first point is you got to shift the psychology away from doing something to people to doing something for people. Agreed. Right? Number two, you have to understand that your business model is going to be a challenge if all you have is one product, which is, you know, we've used Apple now as an example. I think you and I used the Dollar Shave Club example for a while. They started with the shavers. Now they've gone into the shampoo. They've gone into the skin cream. They've gone into the body trimmers, right? They're asking themselves, well, what else would my would my client want, right? And, and the question at, is, what's a logical extension? That's the key. A, what is a sure. logical extension of the product I have right now? Doesn't mean right. you have to go create a portfolio of products like Apple, but just the next one. And that's it. And, and, the example and then the that next I one could with, lead to the next two, right? This right. isn't something you go do all at once. And the example that I used with my clients this week who are in the information space was, think about a university, Yep. right? You go to university, for your first year, and what do they tell you, you got to do? You got to go for three more years, right? And then you finish the bachelor's, and what do they tell you? Wow, you yeah, you you might want to do a master's, right? A good oh, okay. example, undergrad, grad, right? Right? Okay, I'll do a master's. I mean, you're so far down this road, you might as well do a PhD. Oh, okay, I'll do a PhD, right? It there's always a next that has some piece of value that appeals to the person, and and this is the the key point that I wanted to talk about next. People who are buyers, 
or in this case, people who are learners want the learners want to continue to have progress in their life. It's what drives them. Mm -hmm. So in the information example, somebody who's learned from you when they're done learning that thing, do you think that's it? They're done. They're, they're, they're officially done learning for the rest of their life. They've they're retired from learning. We're done. I've, you're the, you're the genius. I've now learned everything that could possibly be learned on earth. I'm never learning again. I'm retired. I'm retired from learning. Yep. Right. Exactly. They're, that's it's not, insa the it's insanity. Right. It's insanity. Good point. Right. Same with your so, life insurance example. When I buy yeah. life insurance, I'm now done looking at any other financial vehicle ever. Checkbox. Craziness. Game over. Right. Because no, what's next? What's new? It's, it's moronic, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're bringing these customers, I don't care if you're selling skin cream. I don't care if you're selling automobiles. I don't care if you're selling life insurance. I don't care if you're selling information products. When somebody has made the decision to buy from you, People don't make those decisions without first having a gut check of whether they believe that you have a good product and you are credible and trustworthy, mm -hmm. right? That's where the exchange happens is once that decision's made. Now, if you provide a great service, great product, and you back up their initial decision with a great user experience, your customer loves you, right? And they feel safe with you. When you no longer take the time to think about or ask them what else they would like to add, buy, learn, put in their house with your skin cream, you have now basically said to them, our relationship is over. Mm -hmm. You must now go back out into the wild, do research, and try to find somebody else that you think is credible and trustworthy and gamble with your money. Mm -hmm. So the customer is sitting in a position where you're forcing them to go do something they don't want to do. They want to buy from you. They already know, like, and trust you. Not only are you not doing something to them. In fact, when you don't offer them something else, now you're actually doing something to them. You're forcing them back out into the wild to go and try and find somebody else that is credible and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. You're you're by not selling to them, you are creating a negative situation where they have to go out and find somebody else, some other company, some other process, some other system that that they they have to gamble on. Mm -hmm. Right? Let me let this me is, let me add a few caveats, right? Sure. So, first one is don't take this at face value and go, "Oh my gosh, I need to go develop a Walmart portfolio of products." This is as simple as a, where is your what's next? So if you're the insurance yes. person example right now, if you're the, I don't know, information marketing, let's say you have a course online that you sell for 500 bucks, right? You look at what you have and you simply go to the next one thing that becomes a logical extension and a complement to your one thing. Now you have two things. That That's how the game is played, right? That's number one. Number two, when you have more products and services in the mix, you don't necessarily lead with all of them. You lead with what I call your flagship product. The one that is the most compelling, the one that has had the most proof of concept. And then what you create is a customer journey where let's say they buy your coaching program online. I'll use like a $500 course online. There's a lot of people selling courses online today, right? We become, you know, hugely into consuming information and education and training online today due to COVID, right? So more accepted than ever today. It was, it was already well accepted as we saw, but in the last two years, it's become even more well accepted and preferred. So if you sell courses or training online, what would be the next thing that they could bolt onto that course that could either be a pivot or a compliment or maybe a new certification or could take them down a path that is in line with where they, like the Apple example. What's a logical extension? Right, So when you tack on extra products and services, don't think you now need to go, oh my gosh, I need to like tell people that, I'm, that I sell these three things and let them pick. This is the mistake I see a lot of, right? Is people get overwhelmed and they think they need to now lead with these new things. But I look at it as put it on the back. Lead with your flagship 
add the next bolt, then the third bolt, and create a customer journey that might look something like this. Let's use your insurance example. Let's say that you sell life insurance. And I work with a lot of life insurance and financial advisors, right? And I always tell them the same thing. When you've completed the transaction and when you've secured a nice relationship and there's rapport and the policy is in place and everything's done and documents are signed and you now have them on your customer list and money has exchanged hands and you have a weekly newsletter going out, however you continue to communicate, figure out in the next 30 days or in the next two weeks, what would be the next thing I could bring them as their planner. You are their planner. You their are their guy. life insurance planner. That's a sensitive topic. There's a million options for life insurance. Whoever, Whatever deal you land, you are now part of their future planning. That's a very big deal. Very few take it seriously. They take it too lightly and they think it's just a transaction. It's a relationship that started with a transaction, but now you're their planner. And as their planner, I would probably come back to them within 30 days. I'd probably have a nice direct mail package go out, big shock and awe package, followed with some emails, maybe some phone calls, right? Saying, hey, listen, our, our clients who are the most successful in planning for retirement, they have great life insurance like you do. And normally what they look at next is, I don't know, I'm just throwing this out here, Aaron, estate planning. So we have an estate planning division. We have an estate planning manual, guide, free report, whatever it is, introduce now the estate planning example into the person who's already down the path of life planning or death planning or death benefit, right? And again, I don't know what it is for you because I'm not in that space, whether it's estate planning, whether it's money management. So taxation, tax planning, taxation planning, right? It's all, and listen, the worst you're going to get is nothing. They'll say they won't respond. Or, no, I already have a guy for that. I already have that. Or, wow, that's interesting. You know, we just completed this life transaction and now we're going to pivot into a state that tends to make, if you can present that the right way, that should make a lot of sense. And it so sense. you do this. And again, yeah, I don't know what it is, right? If it's estate planning, wealth planning, right. money management, and, right? And, and the example that, that I was using, right, that I was talking about earlier this week, you just said it. This actually, it's funny that you just brought it up. So this person... This company actually is in the personal development space. So think like the Jim Rohn. Yeah, the, it's, it's Tony uh, Robbins area, area, right? Tony Robbins. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of like Dr. Joe Dispenza, like that that arena. Sure. Right. So they've got a a paid three day challenge, and then they have an eight week workshop. And they were done there. The eight week workshop right. was like the big product, the higher ticket product, I'm guessing. Like yeah, a coaching exactly. program for eight weeks. What was the price point, by the way? Uh, so the the challenge was 37 and the eight week workshop was uh, 897. So a little under a thousand. Right. It and would be very difficult to build a big business on only an $897 purchase long term. That's the point we're trying to make everybody. With no what's next. Right. right? It's a great starting point though. And they might yeah, not look at it, they might look at it as an ending point. Well, they but it's were a great starting point. There point. you go. Right. And and you know, when you look at it, the cost to run the business, the cost of media, the cost of us, the conversion rates, they're making a little bit of money. There's a little room. There's a little money. Mm -hmm. Right. But as get we it. continue to scale and things get more expensive and you gotta hire more support staff and all this kind of stuff, that profit goes nowhere fast, right? Yep. Yep. So I said, there's got to be a what's next. And they're like, well, we don't know what, what's next. And I said, I'm going to give you four or five different ideas. One of the ideas I gave them was exactly what you just said. I said, people who are typically in this space, they want to share their revelations and their, with other people, right? Why not offer them a six-month intensive with a certification at the end of it for those people who want to make this potentially a career life path and charge – $10,000 for it. And for those people that don't want to make this a career life path, right, have potentially some type of inner circle with a live event. Exactly. I was, you know, I was about to year. say that. Where, where, where is bolting on coaching and then where are the events? Right. And so now they have two paths at the end of this. Are you entrepreneurial and you want to share this? Great. Go this way. You, 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 you just want more you want to stay same, plugged into a access. community in our coaching program, you should there there's it would be insane not to have continuity. 
Right. It and would then, be so, just you and I actually probably I would safe to say we don't even look at many businesses today that don't have a continuity back end bolted on. Like there's no stability. And there's exactly. no and there's no real asset being built. It's a transactional based business. Right. And then what I said to them is if they don't take one of those two things, let's just put them on monthly group support at ninety nine dollars a month. So there's our continuity. There you go. Right. There you go. And at and then bare minimum. They were so excited. They're like, oh, my God, they chose one route. Right. They're like, this is what we're going to do. Actually, they chose all of it. They, everything I just said right there. And then I said, great. What's next? And their face went like this. Oh, there has to be another thing. Yes. There always has to be a what's next. But the key for them, as you probably mentioned, is let's get the one thing built first and then Correct. we build the second, right? It's, it's, you got to be careful with simultaneous versus sequential, right? Business owners can get, some of them can pull off simultaneous, most of them can't, which means it becomes right. sequential. Let's launch our certification program, prove concept, get that revenue stream bolted on. Let's now add our continuity coaching program for when the eight weeks is up. Let's get that done and sold and bolted on and prove concept, right? So you stack it and stack it and stack it, and it's like a compound effect. That's how I see it working best for most, but that doesn't mean you couldn't develop two things at once. It just becomes a yeah, capacity and I'm not thing. You should try to do everything at once. I, I, but I wanted to drive the point home with them while they were open to what I was saying. Be thinking ahead. There's always a what's next, right? For a certain percentage of people, there's always, there's going to be a certain percentage of people who take the what's next, that's right? right? That's right. And a lot of people might be saying, oh, well, I, you know, I don't want to, I work for a company or um, I'm, I don't want to like, whatever, whatever excuse you want to give yourself of like, I, I don't know how to do a what's next. The what's next doesn't even have to be something you create. And, uh, and an example is you and I were in a meeting not long ago with one of your private clients where they are a patent attorney, right? We won't give away the name, right? And I said, what happens after somebody patents their product, right? Like, dude, I'm sure they have to start marketing it. That seems to me to be the next like logical step or manufacturing I think we said, it. where's this beautiful website to present it, right? Isn't that a nice add-on? Right, exactly. Like, well, you have to manufacture it. So have you established some relationships with manufacturers that you could then say, okay, the next logical step is you need to manufacture it. Let me introduce you to my top three you know, suggestions for manufacturers, you do a relationship with the manufacturer, you take a 5% override for the introduction, right? And then you follow up with them in six months because now they've got the manufacturing done. Well, hey, now we got to start selling it, right? Well, let me introduce you to the people who build social profiles and websites and do digital marketing and- Marketing blah, blah, agency blah, blah, blah. Is, a, is an excellent extension to a done patent that's now ready to be marketed to the world on a product, right? I mean, think about that. Right. It's a logical progressionary next step. Again, not doing something to somebody, doing something for them. If you don't have those in place, what happens with the client? They go, great, I got the patent. What do I do next? Well, I guess I'm gonna have to find a manufacturer. Now you sent them down the rabbit hole of Alibaba and Chinese manufacturers and freaking, I've been down that world. That's a spider web of lunacy, right? It, why wouldn't you take the time to figure that out yourself and establish some core relationships and save your poor client the trouble and offer that to them and make some money on it? They, they're they happy. You're happy. They trust you. You 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 trust whoever you're saying. Like, it, it's so simple when you stop and you take a step back and you think about it and you get over this psychology of I don't want to keep selling to people and understand that if you don't, you're doing them a disservice. They want you to. They want you to sell them more stuff. Hence the title. Hence the title of the show. Hence the title of the show. So really keeping it simple here is, is just take a step back and figure out what's the one thing that would be a logical extension of my current one thing. That's the, the, the easiest way to conceptualize this. And then from there, Maybe for a long time, there isn't a next what's next. Maybe that takes a few months or even a year to get off the ground and prove concept and, and that revenue becomes stable. And then, right, sometimes it's a long-term play, right? Don't think this is a short-term thing where you go out and you create two or three what's next and you launch all these in the course of a year. I mean, you could certainly work at that pace. And sometimes it makes sense to have things happening at the same time. But for the most part, it's a gradual process. But if there's no process at all and you're just pounding the one thing and going to the next what's next, what's next, what do they, they call you? You're a hunter, right? Yes. You're, you're essentially just hunting for the next transaction. You're not trying to make the business more stable. 
with more bolt-on income, more residual income, more continuity income, right? So you gotta, you know, you almost have to step away from the business sometimes to see this. This should be extremely eye-opening for you just listening to this because for some people you're like, oh my God, I have all these customers. And as soon as I sell them that life insurance, I don't speak to some of those people for two years. They call me when they right. have a question, right? No, like no follow-up plan, no what's next, no estate planning next, taxation like we talked about a second ago, none of that. So that's a thoughtless business model and it's a thoughtless customer journey. And I think if anything you take from the show, it's how do I create the very best possible customer journey I can so that I can keep my clients interested and happy and, and I bring them value, but I'm also creating more customer value and more profit for my business. It's a win-win. So when yeah, and, and one of the, the terms that I use that seem to like really open up the eyes, I have a client who's a senator um, in the United States and she's got her own business that I'm working with right now and she helps women overcome a whole bunch of issues, right? Is I said to her, you're a guide. You're not a business. You're not a salesperson. You're a guide. When somebody comes to work with you, you, you solve this issue and then you think about what other issues there might be or what other things they might want to have, they want to improve. And you already have the plan laid out for them. And at each step, it's logical for them. It makes sense. A transaction is made and you're the guide. If you can like pull yourself out of your business and go, I'm not a business. I'm a guide for this avatar. So what else will they need? What could improve their life? What could make them happier? Blah, blah, blah. And you, and you just try using that word in your head. Mm. It all of a sudden you go, Oh, Oh, I'm the guide. Tour right. Guide. Uh, yeah. Like uh, it, I can, you, you can look at any example you want. We used Starbucks the other day and I was talking to the team about this, right? Why can Starbucks be so successful? Because they have, a, they have a lifetime value of almost $40,000. Right. So they go, OK, we're going to make the best coffee. And they go, I want to be a guide on this amazing experience of coming into, you know, the thing you said, the third place. They called it. The, they want to be the yep, third place. Right. You know, work, home and Starbucks, the third place. Yeah. Right. What else could we offer people? Well, I think we should offer people they, sandwiches. They added food. Right. They I think we food. should offer people to go meals. I think we should offer people fresh juice. And by the way, if, there will be a what's next there. So if you look at Starbucks right now, they logically moved into food. So there's a perfect example. And you will see something else is my guess. Like I'm starting to see juices in there now, like like the green yes. juices. Fresh like juices. Like you just mentioned. There yeah. might actually, it would not surprise me if they got into like the Jamba Juice smoothie side of things where they're making the smoothies because they're already kind right. of there already with like some of the exotic coffees with – it's kind of frappy, right? You know, yeah. the things that have like 2,000 calories and 462 grams of sugar, you know, those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so those bombs are there. But I could see them going the healthy route, right, which is on people's mind these days is how do I, you know, go into Starbucks and not do one of those sugary high-calorie drinks. I could pivot and maybe do a little espresso in here but have – cashew milk instead of regular milk and maybe instead of sugar there's stevia and maybe you know there's a protein like i could see them getting into the smoothie side of things because guess what people are looking for it and they'll go right next door to get the smoothie and have it with their coffee or vice versa so it's the same kind of thing right it's the same kind of thing don't let the big I mean, businesses they're starting to get into giftware who is because People who go to Starbucks. Yes, I'm seeing that too. And you're a great point. Starbucks friends. The cups and the in the in the pottery and you're you're right. There's I've I've bought a mug there before. Now that you mention it, yeah, right. So that's a huge revenue stream. Again, two big examples, two big publicly traded conglomerates. But the lesson is the same. They saw what what is a logical extension of what I offer right now, and then how can I keep my mind on that path, right? So like you and I. As we grow our software company, Pipeline Pro, the company that powers this TV show, we are literally month after month bolting on different things. Maybe we miss a month, but we don't miss many. We're bolting on different services that we know are out there, that they're going to go buy somewhere else, that we can bring in-house and keep it all in one ecosystem because it also creates a huge convenience factor for people, right? When yeah, they, they don't have to go start a new relationship, it's very convenient. Right. When they don't right. have to go give a new person that they don't know if they trust or like yet money, it's very convenient and it's peace of mind and it's liberating. 
So we are all down the path of keep it all in one ecosystem, work with one team, and we'll continue to bring you the best experts, thought leaders, vendors we can. We've talked in a previous episode, I think it was last week, I don't remember, or the week before, about joint ventures so that you don't have to be the person fulfilling all of the products and services. We now have three high quality vetted joint ventures within the ecosystem that we can bring someone a done for you traffic service, a virtual assistant, a local Google My Business service. I mean, we're not fulfilling it, but we're overseeing the process from the vendors we've brought in. Think about the partnerships that happen in the big world out there of these Fortune 500 conglomerates. Starbucks, in our example, has partnered with who, Aaron? Trivia question for you. Ooh. You live in a bubble. I can't eat. Like, you're like the guy on an island under a tree. You won't know because they don't have targets where you live. But <laughs> we do not have a target. But you've been to Miami and you're here a lot. And yes. Target is now partners with Starbucks. I don't know if you know this. Really? So inside of all targets now is a boutique Starbucks. Because Whoa. Target said, what did Target say, Aaron? All Target my people are tired and they need caffeine. So on the way out the door... Why don't we go do a deal? We're not going to make coffee. We're, 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 we're Target. We're not going to fulfill that product like I'm saying here. We're not going to get into machines and have Target coffee. But we know Starbucks would love to, to take a what we call a toll booth position inside of Target. And it's a win-win because that line in Target, I don't like going to Target personally. But when I go, there's a Starbucks there. It makes it a little better. You know what? I guess I'll take a walk and I'll grab a coffee while I'm in Target because right. they've done the, the joint venture, happen. Aaron. They've done Think the joint venture. You get it? Yeah, I know you did. It's fantastic. And think about all the things that come out of that. For those t people who go to Starbucks that never went to Target before, now they might consider going. So they it's, they now It's also a know, cross marketing approach and cross with both businesses right? so that win. That increases their customer base. Exactly. Right? If they have a coffee in there, they're going to be a little bit more alert, which probably increases buy rate. Probably, they're going to spend yeah. a little longer because they've got some something nice in their hand. You know, if, well, geez, if man, if you're right about out. that concept, I'd rather put a bar in there and get them drunk than get them <laughs> excited. I mean, that would be a better buying experience, right? Wouldn't you think? Well, interesting. I'm going to give you another example. Hey, Walmart, if you're listening, Target did did Starbucks. Walmart, you might want to do the bar. Maybe. Alcohol. I'll, I'll, I'll show you why you're so bang on here. Costco. When was the last time you were at Costco? I don't really do it Costco person. I mean, I don't go, I don't like going to department stores, but Costco okay. years ago, years ago. So Costco is huge in Canada where I'm from, right? I don't do crowds, man. I never did. <laughs> they, they've always had a restaurant at the front, not like a sit down. Well, there are some tables, but really it's more of like a takeout restaurant. Yeah. And they always have like pretty much the same five things. They've got like a hot dog, French fries, a cheeseburger, and I don't know, some, something else. And they keep the price. The hot dog has been a dollar for 20 years. Is that right? And it's a great hot dog, right? Why? Because rather than a person making a decision between food and shopping, now they're together, right? It's the same example. People will come in for that dollar hot dog that's, and they've never raised the price on purpose. And they know that person gets in, even if they say, I'm not buying one thing from Costco today, I'm just going in to get an amazing $1 hot dog. Well, while I'm here, while I'm here. They're going to walk by that kayak or whatever stupid thing, you know. Honey, is do we need anything we while we're here? Exactly. That's the question it elicits every time. Do we need anything we need while we're anything here? Honey? We're here. Huh? Do we need As a matter of fact, we need three things. And I didn't realize it three minutes ago. <laughs> but, but now <laughs> That's they're in it, there. man. I mean, this is it. That is the lesson. Yes. So That's I'm going to end it with this. You can watch or listen to this show and you can sit there and go, man, I learned a lot today and do nothing. Now I got to get back to work. Or you can think about it like I think about it. Every client that doesn't have the what's next in place, I know that somewhere between 10 and 30% of their customers are willing to take the what's next. And every dollar that goes by, every day that goes by, I think about the dollars that they could be adding to their pocket for free with no extra marketing because the people are already in there. And it causes me actual pain inside my body because the customer's leaving to go get it somewhere else. You're literally burning a pile of money on your table every single day. So you can do nothing and say this was a great episode or you can do something and go start shoveling the free money into your bank account.
and start with The Power of One. There's a great book out yep. there called The Power of One, bestseller, highly recommended hardcover book with all kinds of cool designs in it. But it's called The Power of One for a reason, because we as humans are wired to do one thing well at once. It's not a multitask thing. It's sequential, not simultaneous, as I mentioned before. Go find your next one thing, which will lead to the next one thing, which ultimately hopefully leads to the next one thing. But don't think you need to become this portfolio of products. Really, you need to find the next one thing that increases value, provides more value to customers, and ultimately increases your customer value so that you can scale the business. Because like Aaron's example before, that coaching program that was eight or nine hundred dollars, if it if it ends there and doesn't begin there, it's going to be really difficult to be profitable long term with the escalating cost of what it takes to buy media to get the right customers. I think that's a good ending. Right note. on, my friend. This was a good one. I appreciate you sharing those case studies. As always, you can see all past episodes of Sales Velocity TV, everybody, at our webpage, salesvelocitytv.com. As always, live every Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern, on the public Sales Velocity TV Facebook channel, and of course, on all your favorite podcast platforms. That's Aaron. I'm Andrew. We will see you on the next episode of Sales Velocity TV. Over and out. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sales Velocity TV is powered by Pipeline Pro, the ultimate all-in-one sales pipeline management and marketing automation platform that makes all others obsolete. And we can prove it. Take a tour at gopipelinepro.com. See you on the next episode.